Let me just ask you a few things. You grew up yeah. in Singapore. Yes, I grew up in Singapore. And what made you choose medicine? Uh, I think it's uh, there was not particularly any major career decision at that time. I chose medicine because many of my classmates uh, in high school were saying this looks like a good course to do, and so I kind of like followed the. Uh, I followed the herd essentially, right? I, 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 I thought that, um, of course, you know, this desire to help people has always been a reason for people wanting to do medicine, but there wasn't a real particular incident or any particular moment that I felt that I wanted to be a doctor. I, I, I thought that it was a good career and, uh, and a good course to study. And how did you land up in research? How did you get interested in research? And how did you decide to make it a good part of your career? I think like most uh, medical students, we all wanted to be doctors. And our exposure was, uh, and our role models were doctors. So it's very, uh, it's, not, it's not deliberate for us to want to do research. Uh, I would say that my pathway to research was that I had a very good experience and I had a good experience because when I was given the opportunity to do a research year uh, overseas at Johns Hopkins uh, I took that opportunity to spend a year away thinking that it's probably not a but big sacrifice it's not too long uh, and uh, it's away from Singapore but I really dedicated my time to making sure that that one year was worthwhile and that uh, I spent my time making sure that the project was completed. I wrote a paper, in fact, several papers from that. And then I think then you feel that, you know, you have a knack of doing research and that's when you get hooked, essentially. And so several years later, I went back to Hopkins to finish my PhD. And that's when I think I really felt that there was a good... Uh, uh, synergy for me to do research on top of my clinical work. And then you went to Wisconsin? Yeah, so I finished my PhD at Johns Hopkins and uh, I was offered an opportunity to uh, continue with two more years uh, as a postdoc. And so I went to Wisconsin and, uh, and that was also a very good time. I think a PhD, you are really like a student. Uh, I think a postdoc year is useful because it allows you to be a bit more independent and yet you don't really need to struggle for finding your own funding and so forth. So you're a bit more independent, you're not under the pressure of studying or passing the examinations for a PhD. So it's usually one of the best times and I remember my mentor in Wisconsin telling me, you will remember, and that was more than 20 years ago now, you will remember that this two years of postdoctoral fellowship would be one of the best years of your uh, life. And I, I think up to now, I look at it and I said, you know, you're free from the pressure of grants, you're free from the pressures of clinical and administrative work, and you can do research in a nice setting, thinking about questions and answering them. And I think that it is true. It is really a good two years of life. Why Wisconsin? Uh, Wisconsin is a very strange place because the area that I was interested in was in epidemiology. And in Wisconsin, uh, in town that I went, medicine, uh, a lot of the people there were very stable. They don't move very much. They grew up there. Their parents lived there, so they stayed there. And so it was the hotbed of epidemiology for eye disease at that time. So they had cohorts that... Uh, were followed from the 80s to the 90s and now you know some have entered their 25 30 years of follow-up and people don't move they like to stay there so it's uh, in america is one of those places where you can get very good longitudinal data on eye diseases uh, and you know so it was my area of interest and then you went to australia so you've actually moved around a good bit yeah. right yeah so what made you go to australia so that's uh, that's also another um i think I say another opportunity that I took, maybe one more than I should, but I, I think was still quite, uh, it was still quite a good opportunity. And the reason I went to Australia was um, a little bit of frustration. I came back from 
uh, Wisconsin to Singapore at a time when biomedical science was just starting to develop, not yet mature, and um, the funding was quite poor. Uh, there was no academic medical centers, and um, doctors were still expected to do clinical work. So I think when I had such a wonderful time mixing clinical work but with a very strong research background in the US. And coming back to Singapore and being entrusted again to not being able to do that much academic work, I, I felt a little bit stifled. And so I think within two to three years, uh, uh, I had a, a, a very outstanding offer actually from uh, Australia, from the University of Melbourne, which offered me a position that I thought maybe I should take another journey again uh, and see whether that career led me away. And so, you know, I spent five, six years in Australia. And that was a really good experience? Yeah, I think it was a good experience because after a US culture, the Australian culture, it's, uh, it was also slightly different. It's a really bit a uh, mix between a British culture and an American culture. I think the Australians were a little bit more relaxed um, they also had to do with much uh, lower quantities of funding. So they, they were able to do more with, uh, with, with less money. And I think that that was quite a good experience from that uh, perspective itself. And it, it's, it, it was as, it's as close as you can get to a, a Western-style academic system close to Asia that uh, allowed me to really use a lot of those uh, learning points back in Singapore. So what made you come back to Singapore? What attracted you back yeah. to Singapore? I think when I came back to Singapore, uh, there were primarily two main reasons. One is uh, probably a need to be closer to family. Uh, my parents were here and uh, my wife's uh, family was here. so we always thought that we'll come back to Singapore at some stage. But the second and probably a very important reason was that uh, the biomedical science enterprise was starting to mature. And, uh, and I was persuaded by many of my colleagues and many of the uh, senior people in Singapore to uh, come back to a system that I think I can contribute. And I think that that desire was quite important. So I felt that I had spent my time away sufficiently and was uh, mature enough to handle a system that really needed, I think, Singaporeans to contribute to the, uh, to the biomedical research enterprise. So I think that fit was about right. So I think that time when I came back was very, uh, was very productive, was very fruitful, and was very rewarding, and it has been very rewarding since. So when you came back, I think the system had already begun mm. to become yeah. more accepting and That's right. mm. a little bit easier to mm. come back and do research. Yeah. Let me ask you two questions about mm. eye. Yeah. One was, why did the eye center mm. be able to develop? How mm. did it really become such an established leader? Mm in research in such a short time, mm. what were the ingredients that made it do so mm. in other places have uh, mm. not been able to do it so well? Yeah. I think the eye center has done well because it had a very uh, strong and visionary leadership uh, over now what are, I'm the fifth medical director, so now it's over five medical directors. Uh, over 25 years and that leadership has always recognized the need to be internationally excellent and without going and without doing uh, what we think is important research there was no way that the eye center could uh, achieve that goal the aim of its leadership by just doing clinical work day in and day out and so I think that value of having research which propels us onto international excellence has always been a very strong foundation. So all five directors that uh, had uh, helmed the National Eye Centre 
has had that vision, essentially. So it's a strong value, leadership, and yeah. therefore a mindset. That's right, yeah. So how can you clone it and replicate it? I think that we are now being quite successful in uh, not just our campus here in the Singh Health Duke NUS system, but even in the other major AMC, the NUHS system, whereby there is a lot more leadership understanding uh, of the importance of having research embedded into healthcare system because we need it. We need it to evolve, to do more innovative models of care uh, and our patients and our families and their families demand that there's always innovation, that we are going to treat them better tomorrow whereas we can't uh, always be doing the same thing. So there is a, both a demand and an understanding from the leadership. I think also the younger people of this generation would like to not be in a system where it just calls for them to follow uh, a textbook knowledge, rot learning, uh, but for them to be able to ask questions and to be able to be part of the solution of you know, getting new answers. So I think the ecosystem is right. I, I don't think the eye center model would be the only one uh, coming up in the next decade. I can already see very promising uh, ecosystems happening in many different areas. And I think that Singapore probably will have five, six areas of strength that they could compete, not just in the Asia Pacific region, but probably even on a wider global scale. So where would you see the ICE Centre five years from now? The ICE Centre of tomorrow should not be uh, really be satisfied with just having patients come to its building for care, but it should have its influence in the community. So, in fact, I do not see an eye centre that is that becomes a bigger and bigger eye centre and having more and more eye doctors. I think patients should be prevented from developing eye problems uh, and, be, uh, and eye diseases should be prevented in the community. There should be more regular uh, screening programmes to pick up problems that needs to come in but also to prevent problems from developing. So I think the eye center's influence must go from a very centric model towards a more regional, uh, national uh, level. And that's when I think having technology such as telemedicine, such as programs that allows us to use alternative manpower like optometrists will work. So the eye center must evolve in this model of care and that will be a successful eye center. So if a student comes and says, they, should they really do research? Is there going to be a career for them? Okay. And is there going to be problems if they choose a research career? All questions that they yeah. ask. Yeah. How would you tell them, what would you tell them that they ought to think about mm. from your mm. experience and what it yeah. ought to look like five, yeah. ten years from now? I think the first is that when you are given a chance to do research, you should take that chance seriously you should give it significant uh, time and effort and then then you'll know whether or not you have a liking and inclination for research and not many students might like it and for those that do not like it what they will have gained and benefited from is that they have a good experience doing it and so even if it's not their calling they will understand why research is done and understand the dynamics of it for those who have given it a serious consideration and feel that this is their calling and their passion, I think Singapore uh, is ripe for uh, nurturing uh, these people. There are strong levels of support at different levels, at the institution level, but even at the, at the very um, local level. I think. I think departments, systems would support it. And I think that in the end, I think the young student should look at it as saying that, you know, do they really want to make a larger contribution uh, to not just their immediate patients, but something for future patients? And if they feel that they want to make an impact for future patients, then I think research is that avenue for them to do that. So I think it's a, it's a very uh, 
right environment for people to embark on this career without feeling that they will be in for a tough time. I think it's always challenging, but it will be very rewarding. You actually have a yeah. the Singh L side mm. and the Duke in US side. And academic medicine is mm. uh, slowly coming together and moving mm. ahead. More and more people are participating. Mm. So what do you see as the challenges? What do you see as the opportunities? Mm. And also for the residents mm. and students, mm. how can they play a role in making this uh, partnership mm. work even better? Okay, so that's, uh, uh, I think the first challenge uh, between two institutions coming together is always uh, a culture and a mindset. Uh, one is a university that is based on, uh, strongly on education and research as its foundation, so discovery and uh, knowledge creation. And the other, uh, Sing Health, is uh, what might be termed as an institution that is on application, delivery of clinical care, and of uh, translation of uh, knowledge. So I think that there is fundamental tension between uh, a university and a hospital system for them to for people to work together and so forth. I think what has happened in the ta last 10 years under uh, a very slow but progressive model has been that we have put a lot of the vision and the mission uh, of having patients at the center of the whole enterprise uh, unite the institutions. And therefore, the cultural changes that has taken place has been very positive. I see that in the future, academic medicine, which brings in the university and the hospital partnerships under this umbrella of AM, academic medicine, will be stronger. What it means is that residents uh, and students will be able to see it as a seamless experience. So they enter Duke NUS as a student and they will transit to the Sing Health hospital institutions as a resident and they will likely uh, become faculty members that will cross the two institutions and be both a clinician in the institution and a faculty member uh, contributing to teaching and research in Duke and US. So the circle will be, will be quite uh, complete and I think that uh, young people have a significant opportunity to uh, thrive in this uh, ecosystem. So you're going to be playing a pretty integral role in making this happen yeah. and shape it. Um, and also I think you'll, you'll also be playing a role in mentoring the next yeah. generation coming up. Are you seeing young people with a lot of potential? Yeah, I, I, I think it, there are lots of young people potential. There's always, the young people always have potential. I think some of them have not been able to express it. Uh, speaking to some people who are a bit more senior, I think there is a bit of regret that, uh, uh, that they have missed the opportunities that are now available to the, some of the younger people. I'm, they can still contribute, but they are not able to become students anymore. So I, th I see that the young people here will, uh, uh, will thrive in the system and will enjoy the system and will be mentored and we'll have many opportunities that uh, in the past when it was just a purely hospital applied clinical system that there weren't those kind of opportunities. So I think that having Duke NUS in the campus has been a very major, very powerful force in driving innovation, in driving creativity, in allowing for more opportunities. There are now much more diverse thinking and pathways, and therefore, I think the opportunities are, are boundless. So it's, it's a very good time to be a young student in this campus. So I mean, I've got to thank you for stepping mm. in when mm. John Rush left, and really also playing a dual role on both sides, getting it together a lot more than yeah. we could have done in the past. And now you have an additional role with the Eye Center, which yeah. I think uh, gives you more opportunity to pull things together, take the lessons yeah. learned, and apply it. Yeah. So really wish you and uh, the whole campus the very best as you all move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Yeah. Thanks. Okay.